Welcome to the Third Eye Show, which brings you ancient wisdom as well as cutting edge investigations into the mysteries of the universe. The Third Eye Show celebrates our diversity, like the unique beauty of each individual wave, and our oneness, like the magnificent ocean from which each wave emerges. We are all one in spirit as we live on this earth plane. The third eye is said to be able to see into the spiritual and psychic realms. At a time when our lives, our country, and our planet are undergoing intense transformations, we will explore topics that will fascinate, enlighten, and empower. Join us as we witness the thrilling ways spirit manifests in our daily lives and the varied paths we choose to create heaven here on our earth. The Third Eye Show is created and offered in love and light. Did you know that you can have a fantastic and fun vacation while volunteering for a good cause? Well, you can. Take it from those who've been there. First, Dana Reed and Steve Morell recount their adventures on a wildlife reserve in South Africa. Next, Nancy Aldrich shares with us her passion for the country of India and her experiences at the Bapagrama Educational Center in Bangalore, which primarily educates the Dalit class in order to help free them from caste oppression. Then, Patty McDonald offers some insights into the astrological influence of the planet Venus in our lives. Venus being named for the goddess of love. Next, Lucia Reed tells us about the important work Women for Women International is doing in reaching out to women survivors of war. And finally, we end the show with inspiring peace affirmations drawn from various cultures you'll see that the people of the world truly are one family on today's Third Eye Show. I'm Dana. And I'm Steve, and we're from New Jersey. Right, and we just returned, well, in January we returned from a trip to South Africa where we did what's now called voluntourism. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what that is and what we experienced in South Africa. So, so um, there's this sort of new term called ecotourism and people are sort of um, getting excited about ecotourism, which could be anything from, you know, uh, rafting <laughs> trips to people who are just concerned about where they're going how does it impact on the place that I'm visiting is this, is this a positive effect on the local people and the economy and the ecosystem or a negative effect so it really encapsulates quite a large area but then there's this also this other thing called uh, voluntourism actually it was a term I wasn't familiar with until we returned from our trip um, and apparently this is becoming more popular since Katrina and since the Asian tsunami. And it's basically where people are spending their vacations volunteerism, uh, volunteering, rather, doing service work in another country. And so I guess that's what we did in South Africa. Yeah, it could be either helping people or helping animals. And mostly what we did was help animals right. while we were away. Right. So uh, people have asked us, why Africa? How did you choose Africa? <laughs> it was kind of a fluke, actually. I mean, um, you know, I've, I've always personally been fascinated with Africa, although uh, you could turn a globe around and stop it at any given point, and I'm probably fascinated in that place. But um, uh, one day I was just surfing the Internet, checking out Born Free's website. Uh, they're an international nonprofit organization that seeks to ensure animals remain in the wild and aren't like in a circus somewhere, for example, where they don't belong living on the road. Um, and so I was checking out their website and they had a little link that you could click on saying how to volunteer, how to be involved. 
I was like, okay. So I clicked on it. Takes me to this other website. I figured anything that's hooked in with Born Free is good. And I started printing off brochure, brochures to go to Africa. And I approached Steve with some of these brochures. Yeah, it kind of blindsided me with, uh, let's go to Africa. Um, at first, wasn't really too keen on it, but as the idea grew, um, really got into it and was looking forward to being there by the time the trip came around, so. Yeah, so, I mean, I have all kinds of wild designs. You know, I'm fortunate to have you who goes along with them. <laughs> and, and like you pointed yeah. out, I mean, you ended up being completely in your element while we were there. Yeah, it was so. a fantastic trip. It was a fantastic trip. So I was excited to I was excited about the prospect of going and you know helping and working hands on with animals. I really I, I really didn't know what to expect, and that was part of the excitement. Really not knowing what to expect, um, but it, it turned out to be really cool. And so uh, some people have looked at us like we're insane. Why did you go to Africa? And you know why were you there helping animals? You could have been on a beach somewhere. Now, having just returned from the Bahamas a couple of weeks ago, I'm no uh, critic of hanging out on the beach somewhere by any means. When we told a lot of our friends and neighbors that we were going there, they're like, Africa, what would you want to go to Africa for? <laughs> and uh, actually, it was, it was some, something that um, was life-altering. We really enjoyed being there, uh, working with animals, seeing them in their environment instead of behind bars at a zoo was fantastic. Yeah, and like that was a, a cool thing for me was you know, going to where they live and observing them in their habitat. So just that alone was very exciting for me, being so passionate about animals. So it just, it's so, you know, on the one hand, it, it was um, a passion of mine to go and help animals and whatever they needed me to do. You need me to scoop poop, I'll scoop poop. You need me to, you know, observe uh, darting, which unfortunately we didn't get to do. Uh, but I was willing to do whatever they wanted us to do. Um, on the one hand. On the other hand, it was one heck of an adventure. I mean, here we were, you know, in the middle of nowhere, living on a reserve. So I was really excited about, you know, the sort of the life-altering adventure element of it as well. That's probably what drew you into the idea. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the other character, cast of characters that were at this reserve. Who else was there? And uh, they were, surprisingly to me, a very young group of people. Um, the people who worked there were South, were South Africans. Um, yeah, we lived and worked with them. It wasn't like we, we were all staying in the same area, so, which was really interesting. We hung out at night, had dinner and lunch together the entire time we were there. It was, fan it was really interesting meeting everyone, talking to everyone. Right. There was a, a, yeah, I mean, we all lived in the same place and, you know, shared the same room where there was the, the one computer and there was one TV that we shared. And so the socialization went on together and we lived together. And um, they, these people made, a, they, they all live there because it's so remote. So they made, this is their life. So these people are very passionate about what they're doing in order to make this their life. And then the other students, we were called students. So the other students who were there with us were um, a, a group of a British, young British women, uh, three other women. And um, they are all very passionate. One was passionate about elephants. One wants to work with animals when she gets older. So everybody sort of, ha we're all sort of in the same boat of being passionate about animals or wildlife or what have you. So it was very cool, these people who are very motivated, um, and very interested in being this. This is their life. This was their life. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to tell you a little bit about what it was like. Every day was a new adventure. I mean, we really didn't know what we were going, going to experience and what each day was going to be like. Um, as we pointed out, we were living and working with the other staffers. Right. The first couple of nights we were uh, we had our windows closed even though it was pretty hot because uh, they told us that you know snakes and spiders and other kinds of poisonous things would be roaming around the area that we were staying in but by the after a couple nights they were you know you'd wake up in the morning and they'd say oh were you hearing the lions roaring last night and we're like no we had our windows shut so <laughs> they convinced us after a little while to open up our windows and you could hear the wild elements out in the out just around where we were staying it was excellent yeah so, and you know, we were, we were off in the butt of a joke because we were Americans. Not only, we were the most, we were the only Americans there. So we were the most foreign to everybody, either being South African or British. So for example, I remember playing cricket 
with I being an American, I've never played cricket before, so I'm swinging the cricket bat like a baseball bat, and they're laughing at me because I'm familiar with baseball, not cricket. So it was, if you're open to another culture, and you're open to being the outsider, um, you use this quite a bit, you can learn. Um, and it was, I, I found it very exciting. So we did all kinds of things. Some things were exciting, some things were less exciting. Uh, some things were hard work. Some <laughs> things were hard work. Um, we were, but it wasn't um, all work, right? It, wasn't, it was certainly not all work. We had weekends to ourselves. Um, and nights. And, and nights, nights, where we socialized you know, with the staff and the other volunteers. So you're very much a part of the team. That was our experience here at the reserve. And um, you know, not only were we you know, working for the animals, but we were also enjoying them as well. In fact, um, there was this one point where we hiked to get close to a cat, um, um, I'm sorry, a rhino and her baby calf who were shading themselves under a, tr a small tree in, the, in a very hot part of the day. Right, we uh, spent a lot of time sneaking up from our truck. We parked far away with the truck and spent some time sneaking up to where we got within, I would say, maybe 50 or 60 yards, something like that, from the um, mother and her calf. And it was just amazing to see them hanging out there so close. And um, our guide who was with us, Anya, she um, was great. She knew exactly how close we could get without getting too close to upset the animals because we didn't want to do that. It was just... It was just right. really neat to see them. She knew how far they could see, uh, so when we camouflaged ourselves against the, at the edge of some brush, um, she knew uh, where we should walk. Apparently, we were supposed to be upwind, so, so they couldn't smell us. So, um, she, you know, she, we we walked in single file and very quietly and very carefully. Um, so that was really exciting. And at one point, I turned around to see how far away the Land Rover was, and it was probably about a quarter of a mile away. Yeah, it was so far. I was a little nervous that uh, there's nowhere to go out here if Mama sees you. But um, it was really cool to get that close to these wild animals. Um, so that was definitely a highlight. And these these are some of the what was cool about this is um, if you were to go on safari and just view the animals, you never would have been able to exit the vehicle and hike closer to them. So this way, doing the trip this way really enabled us to yeah, get... Yeah, because we were employees there, we had more freedom than we or, would have had if we were just visiting. Or volunteers, we, yeah, yeah, exactly, right. you know, exactly. Yeah, volunteer employees, whatever you want to call it. And, right, uh, and so right. because, right, because you, you point that out, you know, we were really able to get a lot closer. Um, one night, we're all just sort of hanging out at the house, and one of the staffers says, hey, we spotted number 39, which is one of the... Um, uh, which is a lion that's on the reserve. It's 133,000 acres, just to give you an idea of the size of the reserve. Um, who has been wandering around and was um, very thin. They were afraid he was ill. In fact, about a week after we left, they ended up darting him. So the other volunteers were able to be on the back of the truck with the tranquilized lion. That would have been really exciting to see. Um, so that's another thing you might have the opportunity to do. Yeah, what was interesting about that too is she mentioned that it was uh, the lion had a number. They don't name the animals on the reserve because they are not pets, they are, li they are um, wild animals. They respect and they, them and they as wild. respect them as wild animals and they're treated as wild animals. Right. And, and that was uh, an interesting thing that we learned while we were there also. Yeah, and it was really <clears> exciting <throat> because there were like 12 of us running and jumping on the back of this land where some people didn't even have time to put their shoes on. And you know, we, we charge out there you know, with, with dust everywhere as we're driving through the African bush as the sun is setting, there he, there he is, this magnificent lion walking around. The researchers wanted to get a good close look at him. Um, one day we went out and we're turning over rocks to see who resided underneath them because one of the staffers was getting an inventory, a photo inventory of the bugs um, and the insects who lived there. So we had the chance to get, you know, we all had digital cameras, so of course we're recording um, who, who lives at this, at this place because it's so vast. So um, we found a lot of things under the rocks. It was really interesting: scorpions, different bugs, spiders. Uh, yeah. It was really tap beetles, um, all kinds of all kinds of stuff, and some really cool rocks too. I mean, some if you're into geology, there's there were really some cool rocks as well. For those of you who might be wondering, we didn't eat any of them. We just watched them. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, um, you know, and then there were other things. Uh, we were they do have two. White lions, uh, white lions are extremely rare. They have two white lions living at the reserve in captivity. They are named because they are in captivity. One's named Queen, the other's named Jabba, which is Jabalani, which in Zulu means happiness. Uh, Jabba was somebody's pet. 
at one time. So these are lions who really are not self-sufficient because they were raised in captivity. The reserve has taken them in. So we were able to just, um, one of the ma managers there was explaining to us how to build a BOMA, which is an enclosure. And I found just the explanation of how they build these things and, and, and what their intention is while the animals are in there. I found it very fascinating. Even the things that are seemingly mundane, I found very fascinating. We were able to meet the lions and assist in their feeding, um, perhaps those are details we shouldn't get into. Um, but you were yeah, lions have to eat too. They have I mean, to eat too, and you were a bit more involved in that than I was. Yeah. I just too have too much of a gentle heart to be involved in that. But that's the, that's the side of the story that you that didn't make Animal Planet. Um, and in fact, actually, Jabo and Queen have been on. I, I believe they've been on Big Cat Diary. Um, but um, it was just really exciting to be behind the scenes. Um, you know, riding in the Land Rover look at dawn, looking for African buffalo. It was really neat. We saw giraffe, hippo, rhino. And also um, by doing what we did, going to this place in a volunteer aspect, we were able to do a trip like this for a lot less money than it would have cost us had we gone as regular tourists. I think that. Yeah, I, I, to point in the out. end, it turned out to be actually cheaper. Yeah. yeah. Um, one day, the local children came by. And that was a lot of fun, just playing. I mean, the kids were loving it um, because there was a TV in our common area, and a lot of them don't have electricity, let alone television. So they were watching TV, and we were playing games, and that was a lot of fun um, to play games with them. Um, we had weekends to ourselves, so we were able to travel, and we, we did travel around South Africa a little bit. Um, we spent some time in Cape Town, which was really interesting also. But. Yeah, great city. Great, Great city. city. And then we traveled about six hours east with the three British women. That we sort of road tripped uh, eastbound to check out more of the country. So, um, you know, it was uh, an interesting experience because it was very different than anything we knew at home. Right. And it actually took a bit of adjusting coming home because, uh, and, and the other volunteers actually have attested to this, that coming home has been a bit of a mind bender and, and it, it has taken them quite a bit more adjusting than us because they, they were there for much longer than we were. Um, but would we recommend it to somebody else? Absolutely. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you want an adventure and you're interested in service, these, these are, you know, if, if that appeals to you, then, you know, find, find an experience that's right for you. What was cool about this for me, it was something bigger than ourselves. It was something we could be involved in that was bigger than us, um, much bigger than us. I mean, to be helping some anonymous creature 20 plain hours away was very exciting for me. Um, to feel like we're making a difference yeah. globally, you know, yeah. was what was uh, really satisfying about the whole trip. Yeah, it's just even a small footprint a small positive footprint somewhere was really exciting. Um, and, and, you know, so if, you, if, if that, that sort of thing appeals to you and you don't mind eating local food, foods and you don't mind, you know, immersing yourself in, their, in another person's culture, you know, this is a, a really exciting thing to do. Um, you're very outdoorsy. I wouldn't characterize myself as especially outdoorsy, um, although I'm not uncomfortable being outdoors. Um, but my point is, I mean, you don't have to be the poster child for the Sierra Club to do something like this. Uh, they had a stu they've had students in their 60s, so you don't have to be kids to do this either. So, I mean, really, there's something for everybody. Um, one night, we actually got to sleep under the African sky. That was really exciting, um, you know, just with, around a campfire with a bunch of the staffers and the other volunteers in a sleeping bag. Um, that to me that was really cool. Yeah, you could hear the sounds of the wildlife, you know, it was, it was excellent. Yeah, and you know, I mean if I could offer any advice to anybody who's looking to do something like this for themselves, um, if, if you're, you know, willing to be a team player and sort of just go with the flow, um, you know, that, that, that would be good advice. Just go with the flow, work with the others, uh, step out of your comfort zone. I mean the entire trip for me was out of my comfort zone, you know, if you're willing to do that. Yeah, be flexible and um, You'll have a great time. Um, that's, so that's pretty much it. That's so we it. had a great time, and uh, we'd recommend anybody to do the same kind of thing. Yeah, go out there and, and serve the world. You're watching The Third Eye Show. You might be thinking why you should be involved in a school in India. I... Uh, Never even considered it myself until somebody moved in next door to me 
and showed me that our world is interconnected, that what happens in my town is totally connected to what happens in every other town everywhere, and that children in my town can connect with children in towns across the world and learn from each other. I became involved with Papa Grama School in 1996 when um, my next door neighbor suggested that my son go visit the school. And I thought, are you kidding me? I have never even left the United States and my 16 year old son should go to India? You gotta be kidding. So, um, being a good mother, I decided, well, I should go too because I needed to see what he was going to be involved with. I needed to see the people he was going to be involved with. And so, our odyssey began. My son was 16 at the time and he was a homeschooler and he saved up enough money to buy his ticket and make the trip to both India and China. And I also worked many hours to save up the money to make a trip. When I went to India, I found a woman who had sacrificed every blessing that the world had given her and gave it to the poor. She and her husband led a life of service inspired by uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And when they met Mahatma Gandhi, he suggested that she, Saraswati Natarajan, a full Brahmin with a 5,000 year old ancestry, should start a school for Dalit girls in particular. So in 1949, that's exactly what she did. She started a school and um, it now is still in existence today. In 1996, it was in terrible repair and Saraswati was 89 years old. The most amazing woman I've ever met. She, uh, she was very tolerant of me, an American. I, I, I arrived in India and I was totally overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by color and sensation and music and sound and smell and people, beautiful loving people who were very welcoming to me in every way. And um, she had retired to an ashram for Gandhian workers. She lived on the roof of a house. It was as open as this porch is here. And she had a sleeping area and a small kitchen. And we lived there. And every day I would get up and I would be all very nervous. And I would say to Amaji, I would say, what are we going to do today? What's the plan? And she'd look at me and she had white irises. She was a very striking woman. And she would say, let us see what will happen. So then I would sit and I would wait. In my westernized way, I would wait. And nothing would happen and I, nothing would happen. And then finally, everything happened. We'd all get in the car, all 25 of us in one little teeny car. And we'd bump along 15 kilometers outside of town. And we'd go to the school that she started. And we met the children there, who go from uh, age uh, fourth grade all the way up to uh, junior high. Uh, there's 400 students at this school. We um, now have both girls and boys. Their lowest caste, this caste has been outlawed, but it's still a reality in India today. The purpose of this school is to give a free education to the students in the surrounding uh, villages uh, to the school. And we also run exchange programs from Keene State University School for International Training, and we are also open to high school groups to come and visit to learn about another culture in a very specifically Indian environment uh, and um, share ideas and learn and uh, have a people-to-people -people connection with the other side of the world. We feel that the world is a classroom. I'm an educator, and I became an educator as a result of my trip to India. It truly changed my life. If you're interested in supporting a work that is 100% volunteer, 
Every single dollar goes directly to the students in the school, then Bapa Grama School is something you might be interested in. We have a website which you should see and you can donate there. Every single dollar goes directly to the school, to the students, to the exchange program. In memory of Saraswathi, we uh, have started a health center. The health center is free. Medical care in that particular vicinity is very spotty and it is open now daily. People come from all over the world to serve there and to experience there as well. Um, we also have a computer lab we're trying to electrify and we also are trying to continue the water supply there. Right now there's been a tremendous drought and we're trying to dig a new well. Uh, some of our successes are the health center where people can go and get free medical care. Um, we've also bought the students uniforms which they're very, very proud of. Many of the kids come to school barefoot, they don't have shoes, they come hungry. We have a free lunch program uh, for the 400 students that stay there and we're also now involved in trying to raise the food for the lunches and have successfully done that if the water holds. There's a, um, a particular type of grain called ragi that is grown there. It's a traditional food, it's a sustainable food, and it's uh, something that they can grow, but water is the key there. It's funny because now it's raining here in New Hampshire and we take it for granted, but there water is so very important. They have a water harvesting set up there so that if any rain comes, they harvest it, they store it, and they reuse it. So um, come to visit us at Baba Grama if you're interested in having an amazing experience, um, meeting amazing children who are so curious about us and how we live. Um, support the work if you can. It's very, very good work. It's affected many lives. And um, ask any questions you would like about this work. Um, I'll tell you one story. Uh, I spoke to a class of students, and they were probably middle school age, 7th, 8th, ninth grade. And they asked me a series of questions that I'll never forget. One of them was, Madam, why is your house made of wood? I live in a log home in the hills of Vermont, and I had pictures, of course, of my family, and, um, and they saw this, and they thought it was a mansion because it was made of wood. And it struck me because there, everything's made of cement or stone. If you're an artist, go to India and look at the stonework. It's absolutely the most amazing you'll ever see in the world. Um, they asked, well, what do you eat there? And I told them, or tried to tell them, about apples and apple trees. And they were so curious, so respectful, and so hungry for whatever uh, I could tell them. And everywhere I went, people would say, do you like India? Are you glad you came? And with a whole heart, I could say yes. Even though, from my Western experience, it was so very foreign and um, very life-changing. So please consider us, and feel free to go to our website. If you would like to donate, it's educationalpraxis.org. That's Praxis with an X. And you can donate by mail at P.O. Box 409, Putney, Vermont, 05346. Um, contact me anytime with questions. It is a 503C nonprofit. All your donations are tax deductible, and they will only be used for the students. I want to underline that. No one who works for this organization takes a single penny. We have no paid employees. 100% of every dollar goes directly to educational praxis, and then we send it directly to Bapa Grama School. So um, if you're looking for an exciting opportunity, you want to come and visit, we've got places for you to stay, um, please feel free to contact us in any capacity. 
Thank you so much for listening to my story. You're watching The Third Eye Show. Hi, uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about the planet Venus. In astrology, um, Venus was named, is named after the Roman goddess of fertility and beauty and the equivalent of, um, of the Greek goddess Aphrodite um, and, uh, and also the Venus de Milo which I'm sure most of you have seen and there have been songs about Venus and Venus is associated in astrology with, with beauty and love and harmony, balance, aesthetics, the arts um, and also you know, money and prosperity and, and possessions um, and, and where it's placed in your natal chart shows um, how you relate to other people and and what you love and who you love you know what kind of person you you may love and the house that it's in um, and in the astrological chart the house is an area of life so the house that it's in shows the area of life where it's where its impact is is felt um, the most strongly you know by by each person the professions that, that Venus rules are things such as um, you know things that are involved with beauty like um, someone who is maybe an interior designer or interior decorator would probably have a strongly placed Venus in their chart or an aspect from another planet to Venus that would make Venus um, stronger depending on, on what that other planet was. Um, some other um, Venus inspired occupations would be you know people who are into the arts you know, peop whether, whether it's painting or music or singing or um, people who are in the uh, field, in the beauty field, like people, hairdressers, makeup artists, you know, people like that, anything to do with beauty and glamour. Sometimes when I'm talking to clients about their charts, the way that I'll explain Venus is I'll say, you know, if Venus was a person and Venus walked into um, the room that we're sitting in, because the room that I use to do readings is really a beautiful room with all kinds of lovely things in it, and so I'll say Venus would be really at home in this room. Venus would love it here. You know, would love all the um, the lovely wall decorations and the mirrors and the colors. And so Venus does behave very differently in each sign. And I'm going to talk about that, you know, briefly about each sign and how, it, how Venus behaves in each sign. But before I talk about that, I do want to stress that, um, that, you know, things do modify it. For example, the house that it's in and also aspects that it makes to other planets and what other signs you may have on your chart. Like you may have um, five planets in Taurus and maybe you have your Venus in Gemini. So your, your Venus may not be as, um, as strong. I mean, it's still there, but it may not be as strong as if you had other planets in Gemini or another air sign. So the whole, um, this is kind of a caveat, the whole natal chart has to be taken into consideration as a whole and synthesized. So keep that in mind as I'm talking about this, because you may read, you may be listening to this, and if you know where your Venus is, and be saying, "Oh, you know, that doesn't really sound totally like me." So you have to take into consideration the fact that all of us, each human being, is a very complex person. You now there aren't just twelve types of characteristics in a person. So just keep that in mind. So um, first of all, I'm going to talk. I'm going to go in order in the zodiac. So I'll be talking about Venus and Aries. Now Aries is a, a fire sign, and it's um, a cardinal sign. So v people who have Venus and Aries tend to be, you know, very very passionate um, in matters of, you know, in relationships. It could be friendships. It could be romantic love, and or even with finances. So and so they can be very passionate, and also um, they might want to move things along really quickly. You know, they're very eager to get things going. They don't want to wait. They can be sometimes impatient. And sometimes they can be um, impulsive, like just kind of jump into something, a relationship, um, you know, without thinking. Take it too far or go, move a little bit too fast. Um, Venus and Taurus is, um, ta well, Taurus is one of the signs that Venus rules, which I forgot to mention. Venus rules two planets, Taurus, I mean two signs, Taurus and, and Libra. And Taurus is an, is an earth sign, it's a fixed sign, and people with Venus and Taurus tend to be, um, you know, pretty patient and pretty 
loyal and, pre and pretty down to earth, and they do, they like to take things fairly slow. Now you really can't push somebody who has a lot of Taurus energy in them. Um, the um, downside of that is that sometimes they can be a little possessive or a little, maybe a little bit stubborn um, in a relationship. Uh, Venus in Gemini is um, it's an air sign and it's mutable, so it's very changeable. So people with Venus in Gemini are usually people who are very social, who like to, like to chit-chat a lot, like to be around other people, um, like to interact with many people. Um, in a romantic relationship, they might be someone who gets married more than once or has you know, a number of relationships. Um, and I guess at its worst, they could be considered fickle. Not necessarily. I don't want people to think because I talk about the more negative side of a sign that that means that because you have that, have Venus in that sign that that's how, how you are. But it's just one possibility that if you were if the energies were being used in a less in positive way, you know, you could have those those qualities. Okay, so on on with it. Venus in Cancer. Cancer is a water sign and is very um, emotional. So people with Venus and Cancer are usually very, um, you know, very kind of mother, motherly, even if they're, um, even men who have Venus and Cancer, they're usually very nurturing and, and protective and sort of, um, you know, want to take care of, of people. And that includes friends, you know, and romantic partners. And so some, sometimes somebody with Venus and Cancer or a lot of other planets in Cancer might be the person who everybody, um, you know, looks to for advice or for comfort that everyone comes to see, you know, when they, when they need a shoulder to cry on. Um, the downside is that sometimes people with Venus and Cancer who are usually um, lovely people, but they can also sometimes be a little bit too protective. And sometimes it's what we call, um, instead of mother love, smother love. So sometimes it can be taken to that, to that extreme. Uh, Venus and Leo. Leo is, um, is a fire sign. Um, and it's very passionate, very generous, sometimes very, very dramatic. Leos like to do things on kind of a grand scale. You know, they're ruled by the lion, the king of the jungle, and they have this sort of royal aura about them. So some people with Venus and Leo, and people who have maybe other planets in Leo as well, you know, are very, usually very dramatic, and they like to be the center of attention, and they like to do things in a big way. So that you know they're very generous. They maybe you know buy their loved one you know a lot of extravagant gifts, and they're not afraid usually to spend money and everything. The downside is that they could be sometimes self-centered and make things more you know a lot about them rather than about the other person. Venus and Virgo. Okay, v um, Virgo is also is an is an Earth sign like Taurus, but it's mutable and changeable. And Virgo is about. Um, you know, service to others, and there's a certain humility to Virgo. They're, they're usually, Virgo is discriminating, cautious, and sometimes shy and self-deprecating. Um, and sometimes somebody with Venus and Virgo, or a lot of Virgo in their charts, um, can be, you know, somewhat picky, um, and, or, or overly critical, so they may be, to be discriminating is a good thing, because you don't want to be bringing people into your life that you, um, that may not be good for you. So it's good to be discriminating, but sometimes they can be a little bit too picky and they, and they may end up alone. So that's, uh, that would be the downside of that. Venus and Libra, again, is in one of the signs that it rules. And Libra um, is, about, is all about um, harmony, understanding, diplomacy, and people with um, Venus and Libra you know, tend to, or a lot other planets in Libra um, tend to really dislike um, conflict, and they really like like to get along with people. They like they like um, harmony. That's really key for them, and ba and balance. And they have a a wonderful way of being able to see both sides of an issue, which um, I think is ri is really the gift of Libra. The downside is that sometimes Librans. Uh, Venus and Libra people don't want to, don't really like to um, bring up issues that are touchy or uncomfortable because they, it's almost like they feel like, um, you know, I want peace at any price. You know, they don't, they don't really want to rock the boat. You know, they don't like to argue. So that would be more of the negative 
um, side of it. Venus and Scorpio. Scorpio is uh, is a water sign, and it's very it's a fixed sign, so it's a very intense, um, very penetrating, very deep. Um, and and Venus and Scorpio loves very deeply, you know, feels very deeply. Um, the downside is that they could be, um, you know, jealous or maybe sometimes controlling. Not necessarily, but if, you know, they may have those tendencies. And sometimes people who are aware of some of the negative tendencies that they have, they may not know it, that it's, uh, you know, that it's caused by um, something in their chart or that it's, you know, it's an influence from something in their chart, but they may be aware of that tendency in themselves and they try to curb it or try to modify it. As, you know, as we evolve, we become, hopefully, you know, more self-aware and so we, we start, we try to, um, um, you know, work on some of the, the issues that we have. Venus and Sagittarius, and that's a fire sign like Leo, but it's much more, it's mutable and, and changeable. Sagittarian, Venus and Sagittarius, um, is, you know, it's very easygoing, freedom-loving, you know, loves to have, loves to have fun, really doesn't like to be tied down. I mean, I'm not saying that people of Venus and Sagittarius never get married, because they certainly do, but they tend to really like their freedom, you know, they want to do things sometimes on their own. Um, you know, they wouldn't want to be somebody who's, you know, really clingy. I don't think they would normally enjoy that, unless they had other planets in their chart that, um, sort that really modified that a lot. But generally, that's Venus and Sagittarius. Venus and Capricorn. Now, Capricorn is another Earth sign. So, and Capricorn is really about responsibility and being serious. Um, so someone with Venus and Capricorn um, would be, very, you know, pretty much take their relationship very seriously. Sometimes they they tend to be involved with people who are where there's an age difference, you know, whether the other person might be older than them or younger than them. Um, they're generally loyal. The downside is that they can sometimes be overly concerned with appearances, you know, how things look to other people or with, um, with status, with that kind of thing. They can be overly concerned with that at times. Uh, Venus and Aquarius, that's also an air sign. And Aquarians are very... Um, um, uh, sometimes are very comfortable with um, giving and with humanitarian issues, but they're, they're sometimes more comfortable in doing that on a group scale rather than a, on a one-on-one -on -one scale. So they, are, they are fair and logical and, and independent, like, you know, like Sagittarius is. Um, now Venus and Pisces, that's a, a water sign, probably the most sensitive of all the signs. So people with Venus and Pisces um, are, are very, very sensitive. They're um, usually very romantic. Um, they sometimes can idolize, idealize the person that they love, their romantic partner. So they may kind of look at their relationship or at the person they're involved with or their friends even, you know, with the proverbial rose-colored glasses. So they may not always be realistic about um, about people, and they can get disillusioned very easily, or, um, or tricked, you know, or manip or uh, deceived, and so they can deceive themselves. And sometimes, it, if it's at their worst, they can be deceptive to other people in relationships. So it's uh, it depends really on, you know, whether you're using the positive energies or the negative energies. And sometimes, you know, none of us are perfect. So at times, I think that I think we all sometimes can you know, use some of the more, some of the less positive energies. But most of us, or those of us who are really aware of it and do a lot of self-examination, you know, try to work on that and try not to do that so that, they, so that we are using, you know, a lot more of the positive um, qualities of each sign or whatever, or any, actually that applies to, to anything in life. So, um, so that's Venus. So um, may you all have happy relationships and, um, and a happy love life and, and prosper. And use your Venus as well. Thank you. You're watching The Third Eye Show. The mission of Women for Women International 
is to provide women survivors of war, civil strife, and other conflicts with the tools and resources to move from crisis and poverty to stability and self-sufficiency, thereby promoting viable civil society. Women for Women International focuses specifically on women survivors of war. Its goal is to help women move from victim to survivor to active citizen. Women for Women is currently working in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Iraq, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Rwanda, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, and Colombia. Since 1993, Women for Women has directly assisted more than 93,000 women and approximately 508,000 family members have benefited from these programs. Women for Women is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that receives funding from individuals, foundations, businesses, and governments. And what that means is that contributions are tax deductible. This is a registered nonprofit organization. The sponsorship program provides direct aid and emotional support through monthly financial commitments and, very importantly, the exchange of letters. Women in the U.S. or elsewhere are matched with a woman, they call a participant or a sister, in a country the organization works in. I think the letters are really important because if you're a woman survivor or any survivor of war and you're living in a place like Rwanda, for example, you may feel that you are really cut off from the rest of the world. You may feel really alone and isolated in the horrors that you've experienced and the the terrible situation that you find yourself in. And I think that that emotional support, getting letters from someone somewhere who is aware of you, who cares about you, who is sending you loving wishes and, and sending you good thoughts and, and communicating, keeping up a, a line of communication with you, I think that's really, really important. Sponsors send $27 a month to benefit their sister. $27 a month. That's less than a dollar a day. Uh, in a month. A portion of these funds are given directly to the participant so she can provide her family with basic necessities. The remaining funds are used to provide her with rights awareness, leadership education, and vocational skills training so she can continue to support her family in the future. So this is the idea that if you, you know, give a man a fish, you feed him for today, and if you teach him how to fish, uh, you feed him forever. So $22 of that $27 goes directly to that woman for her to use to help support her children, have buy food, get medical attention, water, clean water, and so on. The woman receives a monthly financial commitment from her sponsor, which she can use at her discretion. Participants use their sponsorship funds to fulfill basic needs, as I was saying, such as obtaining food, clothing, shelter, to pay for their children's school fees, um, and to invest in an income generating project and otherwise buy things that will help benefit themselves or their families. In addition to the financial commitment, Women for Women International encourages sponsors and their sisters to communicate through the exchange of letters. And as I was saying, I think that that's just so important. Women for Women believes that the emotional support is an important part of helping a woman rebuild her life even though communication cannot be guaranteed on either end. The emotional support is vital for someone who is rebuilding her life. And keep in mind that that is what this program really is about. It's not just about providing for today's necessities or even for an income generating project for the future, but for helping a woman rebuild her life in all aspects. Women enrolled in Women for Women International's programs abroad also receive rights awareness and leadership training the training is designed to help women understand their unique rights politically as victims of war, ethnic and religious conflict, and as voices in bringing about stability. Economically, in understanding their right to earn a fair income. Legally, in acquiring skills to fight discrimination, domestic violence, and other civil wrongs. And personally, 
With respect to understanding reproductive systems in women and men, pregnancy and childbirth, nutrition, stress and stress management, and the spread, treatment, and prevention of HIV and AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases. The goal of the training is not to tell participants what to do, but to give them the tools to make their own informed decisions. After enrolling in the sponsorship program, women abroad also receive vocational skills training in traditional or non-traditional skills based on their scope of interest. Women for Women International staff conduct local research to determine which skills will be suitable in a local economy. Training is provided by local instruction in such areas as food processing, beekeeping, horticulture, leather work, carpet weaving, and so on. Literacy classes may also be available in some of the countries where Women for Women International works. Upon completion of the program, women are eligible to receive income generation support. In Afghanistan, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Women for Women operates a microcredit lending program. To date, there is a 99% repayment rate on all loans, which I think is very cool. In country, countries where microcredit lending is unavailable, Women for Women International provides other opportunities in the forms of cooperative stores, small business training, and support and organization of small group businesses. So if you'd like to get involved in this very, very worthwhile endeavor and help support your sisters around the world, you can become a sponsor to a woman survivor of war. You can make a donation to Women for Women International for a specific country or program or to a general operating fund. Donations help support Women for Women International's programs and activities around the world, as well as support the organization itself. For more information, go to womenforwomen.org and click Get Involved. I would like to add on a personal note that I've been a sponsor for in this um, very worthwhile organization for a number of years, and I have been profoundly moved by the way that what to me is such a small donation in money and, and a little bit of communication, what an enormous effect that can have in helping someone back on her feet and help her entire family. And by extension, that helps us all. When we reach out to one person, we're reaching out to everybody. This is a very worthwhile organization, and I encourage you to look into it and see if it doesn't touch your heart and inspire you to become uh, involved. Thanks. I have seen the bird of paradise. She has spread herself before me, and I shall never be the same again. There is nothing to be afraid of. Nothing, exactly. The life I am trying to grasp is the me that is trying to grasp it. Close your eyes and you will see clearly. Cease to listen and you will hear the truth. Be silent and your heart will sing. Seek no contacts and you will find union. Be still and you will move forward on the tide of the spirit. Be gentle and you will need no strength. Be patient and you will achieve all things. Be humble and you will remain entire. Find the point of peace within. It dwells not in the mind, not in the turbulent, emotional body, but deep in the heart, like a tranquil jewel. Give up the haughty claims of the mind. Give up the anxiety spell of the emotional body. Go straight to the heart, like a babe enfolded in the embrace of its mother. Peace will hold you in everlasting arms. It is a rose softly lit with the light of eternity. Within its temple, you receive true selfhood. Your in-breath partakes of its holy essence. You breathe out its fragrance to heal the world.
the mountains, I become part of it. The herbs, the fir trees, I become part of it. The morning mists, the clouds, the gathering waters, I become part of it. The wilderness, the dewdrops, the pollen, I become part of it. The peace of the beloved fills my heart. I am eternally replenished from the source of peace. I give this unending peace to everyone I meet. I give this ever replenished peace to all the world. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the sun of peace to you. Peace between nations, peace between neighbors, peace between lovers in love of the God of life. Peace between religions, peace between world views, peace between differences in love of the God of life. Peace between races, peace between man and earth, peace between man and beasts in love of the God of life. Peace between person and person, peace between wife and husband, peace between parent and child, and love of the God of life. The peace of heaven above all peace. Bless, O heaven, our hearts. Let our hearts incessantly bless. Bless, O heaven, our faces. Let our faces bless one and all. Bless, O heaven, our eyes. Let our eyes bless everything they see. We at the Third Eye Show would like to thank the Unitarian Universalist Church of Walpole, New Hampshire for graciously allowing us to tape most of the segments for today's show on their beautiful porch. From all of us to all of you, everyone, everywhere, peace.